Cyber risk and compliance automation is finally here. Legacy GRC systems cannot support the powerful, real-time automation and oversight that organizations require to take risks that matter to succeed. CyberSync continuous control automation ingests data from the ITGRC stack to update controls against regulatory requirements and risks in real time, delivering insights and visibility. See how members of the Fortune 500 are saving millions annually by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CyberSync. People require access from anywhere to resources everywhere, but legacy security is ill-equipped for today's hybrid organization. AppGate STP delivers zero trust network access for hybrid workforces and workloads, empowering trusted users with secure, frictionless connections to only what they need. Make your attack surface invisible and reduce time to provision by 91% with AppGate STP, a leader in the 2021 Forrester ZTNA new wave. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash AppGate. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Ben Carr and Lee Neely. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Join us January 20th to learn how to build your own security lab at home. Yes, Paul and Adrian are going to show you how to build your own lab. Then join us February 16th to learn about validation techniques within applications. And finally, join us March 2nd to learn five things you can do to catch more bad guys. To register for these webcasts, visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. And don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. All right, time for articles. Now, Lee, I, I have to give you a little guidance. I, I don't do 21 recaps. I don't do 22 resolutions, and I don't talk about Log4j. So uh, we're, we're going to talk <laughs> leadership and communication. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you probably get enough Log4j on PSW, so that probably keeps yes, you Yes, it's all good. <laughs> this, yes. this is a great so set this, of topics you got here. Yeah, you know, I try to bring out different leadership and communications articles because if you think about this, right, the CISOs are our leaders, they're business leaders, they are continuing to um, work their way up through uh, into the board, working with the CEO, right? And we talk a lot about CISO and CIO relationships and st- structures, et cetera, et cetera. But I also like to pull out articles that are very specific for them and for leaders in general, for anybody that wants to aspire to be a leader. So this first article talks about some of the, um, how CISOs can identify and combat disinformation attacks. And, and look, I think we're in this really interesting environment with a lot of information. What is real? What's not real? Um, What's being blocked? What's not being blocked? I think it's a very interesting time. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of Facebook or Twitter or any of those platforms because I think they do way too much censoring. And, and so, as a CISO, like, how do you how do you cut through the noise? Like, how do you know what's real and not real so you're making right business decisions for your organization? So that's what this first article is about. So what was really interesting is I was thinking about an upcoming interview we've got coming with a friend of mine who's a, CIS, who's a CISO, and some of the things they're talking about are questions I was gonna ask him, like, you know, how, to, how do you figure out what's important? How do you, you know, how do you help you filter through the noise and stay relevant and not miss it? I mean, he's at a, he's at a uh, international corporation around the world, and it's like, man, he, how many sources of threat information must he have to digest? And it, this kind of boils it down, you know, figure out what you can trust, you know, slow down, take a look at it. I, I thought it did a really nice job of summarizing how to get your arms around this crazy information flow we have in this century. Yeah, you know, I, I the thought early... That... Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, Ben. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I thought the summary was good, but like, <laughs> it just took so long to get there, and I didn't... I, I, the wow. article was a miss for me, right? Like, it just, there was a lot of... It was confusing to get to the you know, pretty decent summary points here. Right. But I think that that's, you know, outside of just CISOs, that's any leader. I mean, it's thinking, how do you get the right information in a timely fashion that actually addresses the issue at hand and building that information, putting it forward for the rest of the, you know, C-level staff 
I mean, it, it's really important to have it in the right context, right? So you can mm-hmm. get a lot of information that's really accurate, but doesn't really support your point or isn't isn't valuable. So I, I think trying to suss through the information and get to the outcome in a, in a timely fashion is really kind of the most important thing. I think when you're trying to sort through, you know, disinformation, real information, how do you get it timely? How do you get it to the right people? And I think quality is a big part of this, right? Because remember the early days of threat intelligence, Ben, right? Everybody thought more was better. Like I needed all the threat feeds. And you you drown in all the threat feeds, right? And then you drown (laughs) in it. Or do I need the right threat feeds with the quality of the data that I can use to actually take action off of? And the threat intelligence market went through a morphine phase through this to the point where I think leaders understand now that they have to figure out the high quality sources to use to make better decisions off of and and more is is not necessarily the answer yeah and it's not just it's not just threat intelligence data right it's it's all information that you're utilizing to perform i mean we used to deal with this back at tenable and uh, you know i've dealt with it at, at visa and nokia like it's always how do you have the right context on the data to, to know what's actually important, right? You can have a ton of data, but it's just meaningless and slowing you down trying to trying to get through it. Yeah. This the next article talks about the underlying eleven underlying trends that are going to shape um, the workplace in 2022. And the reason I bring these articles in is, as a leader, you have to realize what's happening at the workforce layer, and, and some of the challenges that you're going to have to face as we go through this. Great resignation. There's actually a story in here about is the great resignation impacting cybersecurity because it is impacting other markets. And so as a business leader who's trying to, you know, build a team, keep a team, grow a team, you know, what are some of those underlying trends that, that potentially impact you? And there are some good ones in here. There's a few that I'm not, I'm you know, like fairness and equity will be the defining issues for organizations. For some organizations, I think that's true. I don't think that's true across the board. Um, but some of these other ones around um, policies, <laughs> corporate policies, right? Some big announcements yesterday from the Supreme Court, for example, on at, uh, for large organizations, no, but for healthcare, yes, around the vaccine mandates, right? That will have a ripple effect in the workforce, one way or the other, whatever side you're on, it doesn't matter. It will have ripple effects in different industries based on some of those decisions. But as a leader, you have to understand that. Like, how are policies that you're putting in place in your company going to impact your workforce? And that potentially one way or the other may, uh, you may lose certain employees because of those policies. So I think there's things you have to really be cognizant about when you're making policy decisions in an organization. So there are some uh, interesting ones in here that I think leaders just need to be aware of when they're planning their team growths for 22. Well, and some some of the stuff I was going through, like the the one about uh, vaccine mandates. I, I what I would say the trend is instead is that we're going to go back to the basics of don't come to work when you're sick. Stay home till you're well, and it doesn't matter what the disease is. Um, there's been a trend of the last few decades to just at all costs show up to work and get the job done, which really isn't healthy. And I, I think that'll, I think that's the better trend, but some of these others are really interesting about things like shortening the work week to try and retain folks. Um, I'm not sure they have the DEI one, right. But I think DEI still remains a, 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 a neat, I, I prefer a diverse workspace. I'll be perfectly honest. It's a lot more fun. It's a lot more challenging, oh, yeah. a lot more interesting. I'm just not sure we've figured out where that's going to go, but I know that people are watching it and that's, that, that'll work. Let's, let's well, keep I it diverse. Think, I think if you look at what, what was interesting, I've, I've looked at a couple stats and I've read a couple articles talking about um, the differences in Gen Z as they start to enter the workforce and mm-hmm. they're really a lot more competitive. They're looking for salary. They're looking for, they're not looking to be as collaborative necessarily Right. So things that really kind of took off, like the the open office and, you know, some of these equity initiatives and fairness, like I don't know if that matches up with actually what that the newer workforce is. Well, I think that there is a lot of value in, um, you know, fairness and equity. I think it's it's where that comes in and whose viewpoint that that takes. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it really has to be with respect to everything, every aspect of the employee. So I think that that that's one thing. With regard to COVID, I think you hit it spot on that 
like stay home, don't come into work. Um, especially we, we've seen with Domicron that it, it, from with the statistics and what it looks like, like people are getting infected, whether they're vaccinated or not, it's just much less severe. So why go to work if you've got a cough or a cold, stay home. And I, I think the the work location is is certainly something that people are taking a lot of interest in and are more interested in in that remote work opportunity. So I, I think as burnout happens and people work more, that trend towards a four day work week makes a ton of sense. And I, mm-hmm. I've seen a couple of companies that have experienced it and, and tried it, and it, it's worked for them. And um, I, I think we'll see more of that. I think w- when we look for what people want in the workforce, I think they want a more balanced life. Yep. Completely agree. I think actually the last two fall under work-life balance. I think work-life balance needs to be a a thing, really, a a, a driver that includes things like wellness and whether you're working four days, five days, 10 hours, eight hours, whatever. That's all in there for in terms of mental health and well-being. Yeah, yeah and it's a better the, workforce, right? You get you get more productivity out of people who are happy and actually enjoy that that balance that they have and less burnout. And I think that's one of the things we're all facing is is you know a high value employees being burned out because they feel like they're always working. Right. Yeah, I'm there. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, back to, we're going to cover aspects. Of are you consider yourself I, always working, Matt, or a high value always. employee? That's why I want to know. Okay. <laughs> oh, not, I'm not a high value employee. I'm a, I'm just always working though. My wife's like, are you, are you going to stop now? Like, come on, you've been on that phone for eight hours straight. Yeah. Um, the DE and I were going to cover in the CISO, um, the Ains report later, because one of the stats that came out of that report, which I thought was interesting is, is, uh, female CISOs actually have a higher salary than male CISOs yes. right, uh, from the study, which I thought was really intriguing because we talk about diversity and, and, and females are coming into the CISO role. They're also demanding a higher salary than their traditional male counterparts, which is not usually what happens, but it, it was an interesting stat. So it, well, we'll it's a change, that. right? It's, it's yeah. kind of the rubber band effect from that. And I think if you look at time to hire, I bet you it would also be shorter for uh, someone looking for a role um, as a female right now. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, so what are the six cybersecurity trends for 2022 and how do you address them? You know, I bring these in here because I'm curious, like, is it that simple, Ben? Is it really you just back <laughs> it up, you enable MFA, you worry about shadow IT and nobody uses that term anymore. I don't. I don't. Um, you, you create a policy, you train your employees and you get cyber insurance and you're done. Like, that's it? Yeah, you like, wrap it's up. that easy? <laughs> Yeah, you just sit back. That's I mean, that's what the untold truth is. You know, most CISOs just hang out after, you know, a week of work and then, you know, the rest of your life's just easy, right? Cakewalk, sitting yeah. on the beach. I it, you know, these it's the same articles over and over saying the same things. Like I I don't know. It's just frustrating when you read these things and it it just comes off as trite. Yes. Because it's not that simple. There are no, no. like just here's the six steps you do and you're done. It doesn't work like that, guys. I'm just, I'm sorry. But that's why I bring these articles in because people have to understand when they're reading this stuff, like, does that really make sense? Like, in when you're sitting in the role, like, if I just did these six things, my day is done. That's not true at all. It's just crazy. Yeah, I'd rather see, like, you know, this, like, number one, like, how do you get buy in from your dev organization? How do you, you know, deal with a corporate culture that's not aligned to security as part of the DNA? Like the, those are the, the harder things that every CISO is trying to figure out how to deal with. It's not, you know, yeah, we all know enable multi-factor authentication. Great. How do you fight off the dev teams that are saying it's a challenge to their, you know, their work environment? And you can't just hit them with policy. I mean, you have to hit them with something that actually makes them want to change. Right. Yep. Some of these would I would file some of these under the things to trust but verify. It's not the complete cookbook, but they're important things to make sure don't that you don't stop doing. But it's not the entire list either. I mean, right. I don't know how many things we breaches we've seen in the last eighteen months where multi factor would have helped, and then you got to make sure people don't go around it. But I like I like I'm with you guys. I don't think this is the comprehensive list, but it's good things to know about in making your total list. Yeah, but do you feel like anybody anybody who who's in the role doesn't know these six things? Right. Like there's nothing I mean, you new would. there, right? There's nothing new there. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing new there. 
I've been doing this for, except for cyber insurance, all the other stuff you've been doing for almost 25 years. Well, good luck getting cyber insurance right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. No, that's true. Because it, it's funny, we um, we did post an article on securityweekly.com. Deb Radcliffe wrote it about how the, the premium spikes are just going crazy uh, because of all the ransomware payouts. So good luck getting coverage if you don't have some basics in place because you're yeah. not going to so, get it. Self-insure. Yeah. Get, open up a bank account and start self-insuring. <laughs> Or just put a reasonable amount in your cyber program and try to deal with it on the front end. <laughs> yeah. But see, cyber insurance was an excuse for the C-suite not to have to fund cybersecurity because they had a policy. Yeah. That yeah, worked out yeah. for, what, a whole year and a half, two years? <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Is the great resignation impacting cybersecurity? Uh, I pulled this article in because I do threaten my leader's how about every quarter or so to just fire me? It, I do. It, it, it's kind of fun, actually, because I'm like, maybe I should just resign and go to a golf course community in Texas. Oh, oh wait, I'm actually going to do that. Um, so I was curious, like, are we seeing an impact to cybersecurity? And this article brings out a couple interesting highlights that I thought, you know, we're not to the point where senior folks are leaving security to go open a flower shop, right? Which, which okay, great. <laughs> but he says, it, it, but there are things happening, like serial CISOs who've been around the block are looking at, you know, maybe being like a part-time virtual CISO instead of doing the grind every single day. So there is some level of change happening uh, during this period, but it doesn't look like there's a mass resignation going on quite yet in cybersecurity. I. Yeah, I think it's the the opposite of that, really, right? Like, I think that there are more and more people trying to figure out how to get into cybersecurity and salaries and benefits and, you know, just people's perspective and, and the way they're respected within a company is just, it's on the rise, right? So I, I'm seeing, I, I mean, yes, there are serial CISOs that say, look, I've done this, like, what am I looking for? They're not challenged. And so they're they're looking for other challenges and having that virtual CISO where you're doing a different thing, you know, every other day, that that can be intriguing, right? As also, I think, you know, some of the salaries on a consulting side can be can be quite compelling. But I also think I've read some recent articles, you know, highlighting where some CIOs are actually and, and directors in IT are actually moving into the security realm because they're seeing the importance of it and kind of the the sea change shift that's starting to happen. Um, and we've talked about it before you know, roles where CISOs are actually taking over CIO responsibilities and the, and the role is kind of still morphing and evolving. So I, I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that anything's slowing down from a, from a cyber or a, a CISO perspective. Right. Because this next article is competition for cybersecurity growing fierce as cyber attacks increase, right? Which is kind of the, that's why I put these yeah. articles back to back, <laughs> which is because that, that's what I see. I see the demand for cyber experience. You know, uh, occasionally I get a ping on LinkedIn, like, hey, can you help give me career advice on how to get into the, into the space? Right. I, I just yeah. had a call last week with somebody who's completely outside the industry, wants to come in. He's like, well, should I go to the Carnegie Mellon like CISO uh, certification program? I'm like, you're going to spend a lot of money. And I'm not sure that's how you get your foot in the door. Yeah. Like, yeah, I can get the chops. Yeah. Right. And, and so people right. are curious, like, do I need a certification? Do I need, you know, to go to these courses and this, that and the other thing? And, and my my answer to them is it depends. Like, where's your background? Where's your skill set? How, you know, what kind of companies are you looking for? What's a potential way to enter into the space without needing to be a, like a certified yeah. CISO, for example, right? What, what type of role do you want to have? You know, if you're trying to be a CISO, what type of CISO do you want to ha be? I mean, I think from an external perspective, it's it's a very monolithic thing. But I think when you when you are actually in the seat or in the, you know, in security as a whole, you see that there's such a wide diversity there it's it's really all over the map and you have to figure out what you gravitate towards and what you're going to be successful at. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I what I worry about is that, you know, you've, you've got, uh, you don't have big enough security teams. So they're all just exhausted and you, you just try and walk into the CISO there. You're going to get a team that's burned out. How can you possibly win without having to go on a, on a hiring spree or something? Um, and if you don't have support from above, you're, you're done. Um, 
and and that that's a, you know back to our prior article. I, I read some of it is just plain out burnout. I mean, I think there's lots of opportunity, and CISOs are important. Um, but this last couple of years, I think the 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 levels up on the on the cyber bar, and I don't know that everybody's keeping up with the resources to keep people successful and successfully employed. Yeah, yeah. I, I would concur with that from the perspective of um, you know over the last two years, there's just been a workload dump truck that rolled up on cyber, right? And the the amount of work and people work people from working home and this we've talked about this a bunch. We talked about it today. Just, you know, it's eight o'clock and you're looking up and you're like, man, I'm it's eight o'clock at night and I'm still on the phone, you know, doing things because the work life balance isn't there. And so I think people are really looking for that. And that's mm -hmm. I think people shifting jobs, looking for that balance, looking for companies that provide that. So I think it's a challenge between one, making sure that you're getting resourced from you know the rest of the sea level is is realizing that that you need resources and you can't operate twenty four seven with one guy, um, and at the same time looking outside of the normal, looking at real diversity, right? Looking for people who might come from other fields or might have other skill sets that you normally wouldn't think about from a cyber perspective, um, and doing that I think can give relief for being really hard to hire right now. This article also mentions the IN's uh, CISO compensation benchmark report, which I downloaded. Um, and it, it has some interesting data. We talked about the one point that if you're a female CISO, your salary is higher than your male counterparts, which is is a great sign. It also identifies like what are the big financial services, tech, and manufacturing are the big like highest paying CISO jobs. So there's some interesting data in here. It breaks it down by region. Uh, and where you're at. So if if you're an aspiring CISO, you're a current CISO looking to move, some interesting data in here that, that might help you with your next career move, just saying, because um, there's yeah. some good data in there. Uh, and then the last article we're going to cover is um, career planning advice. Like, ask these five questions as decide your next career move. Um, and we talk about some of these, right? Uh, in general, uh, on the show, Ben, w you, Jason, and I talk about them on a regular basis. Like, do you feel valued? Am I, yeah. am I fulfilled? Like, it, is this the right place for me? I mean, like, like, these are questions that employees ask themselves when they're at an organization and they start to look, if they're not fulfilled, if they're not learning and growing, if they're not, you know, uh, feel that they provide value, they're going to start looking. Um, and when you look for your next job, you want to make sure that you fill these gaps. Like, just don't go make a job move for the sake of a job move. Because if you're still not fulfilled and in, in, in growing and learning, you're not going to be happy at the next job either. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, that, <laughs> what makes you happy? Like, what, what, like, I think, you know, they put it as like, how fulfilled am I? I think it's, it's maybe a little broader than fulfilled. It really is like, what's your level of happiness and joy in what you do, right? And if at the end of the day, it's all about compensation, you, it's miserable, right? If uh, if it's just, you know, you're stuck there because you have to be, um, it's not a fun place. I, I think you really have to kind of, at the end of the day, enjoy the people you work with, enjoy the environment, enjoy you know, it, everything's not enjoyable. Like certainly there are bad days and there are bad points, but at the end of the day, what we're all looking for is to have, a, you know, a fulfilled, happy experience. And so I, I think the more you can look for that and find that and identify those areas that are really important to you, right? That's, that's self-searching that you have to do. Um, and I think, you know, you, I think you mentioned it when you go, it's not just about you, it's about the employees, right? When you start to get into management, um, when you're, you know, C-level, like, what are you conveying down to your employees? Are you conveying, like, we don't have a work-life balance here? Or are you showing that there's a way to do that and you value employees that are actually not getting burned out? Um, making sure your employees happy is really super important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was well, I uh, go ahead. I was good to say, I was talking to Paul earlier today. He goes, I get to do Hacker Heroes, Paul Security Weekly, and a bunch of tech segments. He goes, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> And he gets to smoke a cigar <laughs> and drink while he does it. So, you know, like mm -hmm. that's happiness in for some people, right? That's all you need. Yeah, that that was pretty much exactly where I was going. I mean, there was a time when I had my job where I would basically said, I would do this anyway if I wasn't getting paid. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like getting paid. But 
It's because the majority of my job was stuff that I really wanted to do, uh, stuff I love. And like like Ben said, there's that doesn't mean there's not a bad day or we get mired in the weeds and it's not the stuff you love. But doggone it, I've been lucky. Most of the stuff I've done through my career, including these podcasts, are stuff I love and it's wonderful. And that's what keeps you going. And then having support horizontally and vertically uh is is awesome i liked his point about building relationships not just in the sector i mean don't just befriend other cso's or other cybersecurity folks meet people outside them and uh and develop and i'd say developed outside interests too i mean hell one of the things i do i'm on the train collectors association i'm a model railroader i love that and i it's a completely different community than the cyber community and it is a blast so like i said diversity and and you know what some of those guys I think are actually senior people at other companies. If I needed a job, I could probably ask, but who right. knows? It's all about the network at the end of the day, Lee. So, do, you know, make sure you got a nice broad one just in case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. Next Monday is a holiday. So we'll see you again in two Mondays on Business Security Weekly. <laughs>